Thank you for joining us. Our webinar will be beginning shortly. Thank you for joining us. Our webinar will be beginning shortly. Thank you for joining us. Our webinar will be beginning shortly. Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar. On behalf of NIOSH supported education and research centers throughout the country, we are pleased to present the 2019 ergonomics webinar series, offering free monthly webinars on various topics on human factors and ergonomics. This collaborative effort on behalf of each ERC's continuing education program aspires to provide access to current research supported through NIOSH ERC programs. Thank you for joining us today. Today's webinar, Large Herd Dairy Milking Parlors, Exposure Characterization and Intervention Analysis, is brought to you by the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston and David Dufresne, PhD, MPT, MBA, CPE, CSP, and University of Iowa and Nate Fedke, PhD, CPE. A few housekeeping items first. You will be muted during this presentation. If you would like to ask a question, please enter it into the online chat or Q&A. We will save time at the end of the presentation to address as many questions as possible. If you have a question about a specific slide, please note the slide number and include it with your question. This webinar will be recorded and archived for viewing on COEH Northern California's website, Facebook, and YouTube channel. At this time, I am pleased to welcome our presenters, David Dufresne, PhD, MPT, MBA, CPE, CSP, is an associate professor in the Southwest Center for Occupational and Environmental Health, Department of Epidemiology, Human Genetics, and Environmental Sciences at the UT Health School of Public Health in San Antonio. Dr. Dufresne earned a PhD in Occupational Ergonomics and Safety from Colorado State University in Fort Collins, Colorado. Dr. Dufresne also holds a Master of Physical Therapy, MPT, from the University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston, Texas, and a Master of Business Administration from the University of Mary Hardin Baylor in Belton, Texas. Dr. Dufresne earned his Bachelor of Science degree in Kinesiology from Texas A&M University. He is also a Certified Professional Ergonomist and Safety Professional. His research and outreach focus for the past 18 years has been concentrated in the dairy industry. 
He has served as principal investigator on several dairy-related research projects and has partnered with two NIOSH-funded agricultural health and safety research centers, High Plains and Intermountain Center for Agricultural Health and Safety and Southwest Center for Agricultural Health, Injury Prevention and Education to address worker health and safety on dairy farms. Our second speaker, Dr. Nate Fetke, is an associate professor in the Department of Occupational and Environmental Health at the University of Iowa, where he directs the ergonomics training program with the NIOSH-funded Heartland Center for Occupational Health and Safety. He also holds secondary faculty appointments in the departments of biomedical engineering and industrial and systems engineering. In addition to his role with the Heartland Center, Dr. Fetke is associate director of the NIOSH-funded Healthier Workforce Center of the of the Midwest at the University of Iowa and Washington University in St. Louis. His research interests include theoretical and practical considerations for the use of direct measurement methods to assess the physical demands of work, as well as the epidemiology of musculoskeletal outcomes among working people. He has led several NIOSH-funded projects focused on the construction, agriculture, and manufacturing industries, and he collaborates with Dr. Dufresne on a series of dairy-related ergonomics research initiatives. Um, thank you for joining us, and I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Dr. Dufresne. Thank you, Jessica. Thanks for the uh, introduction, and uh, thanks for having uh, both Nate and I uh, to become part of this uh, webinar series. Today we're going to talk a little bit about our research, uh, primarily uh, on dairy farms, more specifically within uh, the milking parlor. <clears throat> And hopefully by the end of the uh, presentation, you'll, you'll have a little bit better appreciation and understanding of what goes on in these milking parlors and some of the uh, challenges that uh, these workers face as they conduct their uh, milking task and then how we're trying to assess what those issues are and how we can come up with some practical solutions to make their jobs easier. So some of the learning objectives uh, for the presentation, we're, I'm going to do the best I can to describe the designs uh, of how these milking parlors are set up. And then we're gonna go into a little bit of the uh, direct measurement techniques that we are using over the past oh, 15 years or so to characterize these ergonomic uh, uh, challenges uh, in the parlor. And then we will also discuss some of the uh, control strategies that uh, we have evaluated and how we use those direct measurement techniques to evaluate the effectiveness of these controls. So here's the outline. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the present state of the U.S. dairy industry uh, and uh, how these uh, modern dairy uh, parlor operations are set up. Uh, a little bit about the symptomology, some of the re research that we have conducted to uh, try to figure out what the symptomology is of, of, among these workers in these parlors. And then uh, we'll talk a little, bit, a little bit more specific as far as direct measurement measurements or measurement techniques and then the controls, and then how some novel and innovative ways that we are beginning to address worker performance and how we evaluate that. So a little bit about the current state of the dairy industry. You may have read the uh, news media uh, of how our dairy farms are uh, reducing in number. In 2017, we had over 40,000 farms, and then just recently in 2018, that number has reduced uh, down to a little over 37,000, roughly about 7% reduction. And we've seen this trend over the past several years of a reduction in farms across the country. Simultaneously, we have been seeing an increase in milk production. Well, how is that? How are we reducing the number of farms uh, across the country while maintaining and even increasing the amount of milk that is being produced? Well, that's accomplished by increased herd sizes. So the, we're having a reduction in farms, but those farms that continue to exist are increasing in size. And when I mean increasing in size, I mean uh, larger herd sizes, more cows on the farm. And so with increased number of cows on the farm, um, that means more workers. So more workers on the farm. And so those workers are primarily made up of a vulnerable immigrant workforce. Uh, our research, as well as others across the country, uh, have shown that we're dealing with a non-English speaking workforce, uh, primarily lower literacy and lower education level. 
And over the past two decades, we are seeing that these immigrant workers are having a limited or no experience in agriculture. 20 years ago, or even 30 years ago, uh, these workers uh, that were uh, applying for jobs on the dairy farms come from rural backgrounds uh, with, uh, they have a background of working with large animals. And now that's not the trend. We are seeing more workers uh, being employed on dairy farms where they have no uh, prior agriculture background, no experience working with uh, large animals, and they're primarily from more um, urban areas. Also on these farms, and this uh, applies to all of agriculture, we have a higher fatality and, as well as injury rates compared to other industries. And so um, because of this vulnerable workforce, as well as the, just the inherent hazardous conditions, uh, not only in, um, uh, on dairy farms, but across agriculture, we're seeing higher fatality rates and injury rates. So this is another reason why we are addressing uh, dairy farm operations, more specifically inside the milking parlor. So what do I mean by milking parlor? What, what, what am I alluding to? Well, milking parlors, that's, that's the milking barn. That's where uh, milk is harvested on these dairy operations. Cows are escorted from their pens uh, to the milking parlor where um, machines are set up uh, and applied to the, to the cow and that's where the, the milk is harvested. These are 24 hour a day operations, 365 days per year operations. Uh, there is no button or uh, switch that turns off the milk machine. These cows have to be milked uh, two to three uh, times per day. So uh, these uh, parlors involve re repetitive tasks, which we're gonna uh, talk about here in a little bit. And uh, they are characterized by having sometimes extreme environmental conditions, cold, wet, oftentimes humid conditions because there's a lot of water involved and so um, as well as humidity and so uh, we're dealing with those challenges as well. When I talk about these parlors, these large herd parlors, we're primarily talking about three different configurations uh, in what they refer to as herringbone parallel as well as rotary. A herringbone par uh, uh, parlor, as you see in the uh, left hand slide or left hand of the slide, uh, cows come in and they are angled uh, 30 to 45 degrees away from the pit. And the pit is right here in the middle where workers stand. And the cows are on an elevated platform uh, for easier access uh, by the parlor worker to the, to the udder. But these cows are angled away a little bit. Whereas in a parallel configuration, the cows are uh, parallel to one another. And then uh, a rotary parlor is simply a parallel but the cow steps on to a moving platform. It's like a big merry-go-round. They step on and they slowly rotate around until they get to the other side and they step off. During that rotation, uh, milking units are applied to the cow uh, and uh, milk is harvested. So these different parlor configurations dictate different workstation designs. In a herringbone par uh, parlor, as you see here on the left, uh, the cow is angled. And because of that, uh, oftentimes the worker has to access the udder by reaching around one of the hind legs of the cow. Often uh, the parlor and the railing is open. Uh, you can see the cow more visibly here, as well as the, the cow can see the worker. And um, that is often a, an issue uh, as it relates to being kicked by the cow. So you can see uh, some uh, postures here and the reach um, that is involved in trying to access the udder to uh, perform different milking tasks. Whereas in a parallel parlor, uh, cows are aligned in parallel fashion and the worker has to access the udder from between the hind legs instead of having to reach around one of the hind legs. And then third, in a rotary parlor, as you can see here on the left, uh, big merry-go-round, the worker has to access the udder from between the hind legs with the uh, additional dynamic of the cow slowly moving uh, from one side to the other. And so, um, and I'll flip back here, whereas the worker has to uh, move, walk between cows here uh, to access the cows, uh, the cows are moving to the, the uh, stationary worker who stands in one spot. 
So those are the parlor configurations. Let's talk very briefly about the milking tasks that are involved. There are four primary milking tasks involved in the prep uh, of the udder for milking. Dip, strip, wipe, and attach. Dip is when uh, the worker applies a chemical, and this can be done in a number of ways, but as you can see here in this uh, uh, figure A, they're using what they call a dip cup. Uh, they apply a iodine-based solution to uh, the teeth, one of the four teeth on the udder, and that is designed to um, sanitize the, uh, the teeth in before the milking unit is attached. That dip chemical needs to be applied for a minimum time duration based on the chemical manufacturer recommendations. And so um, it's usually 30 to 45 seconds up to a minute. After the chemical application, uh, the worker comes in and performs a strip uh, task where they are squirting three to four different uh, squirts of milk out of each teat, out of, out of the udder. This is designed to stimulate milk flow of the cow. Uh, research has shown that milk flow is optimized around 45 uh, seconds up to a minute, to up to a little bit after a minute, and that uh, is to ensure that milk flow is optimized. After the strip, uh, the worker comes back and wipes off that chemical, and then lastly, uh, the milking unit is attached. So these are the four different tasks that uh, make up the milking routine. So all of our research uh, is primarily uh, 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 concentrated at the worker level. Uh, and so we're applying the One Health model. And some of you may have uh, heard of this model, some of you may have not, but in agriculture, the One Health model is addressing the health of three different entities, the worker, the animal, as well as the environment. And so uh, what we try to do is look at all the different interactions involved in this triad of interactions how the cow might affect the, the health and safety of the worker and vice versa. How does what the worker does uh, inside the parlor affect the health of the cow? How does the environment, and we consider this a working environment, might impact the health of the worker? And then, and then also, how does the environment and the, um, the environment of the parlor affect the health and safety of the cow? So all of our research has been concentrated on all these different interactions that may take place inside the parlor. One of our earliest uh, research projects was to figure out or assess or evaluate what are the symptoms being uh, uh, experienced by uh, the workers inside of a milking parlor. And so um, we had a project that, uh, that lasted about four years and we went out to a, a multiple dairy farms and we surveyed over 400, more specifically 452 milking uh, parlor workers and assessed um, what were their reported symptoms on, uh, um, on the farm. And so we surveyed 32 dairies across five states where the mean herd side was uh, 2,673. And these are some of the selected findings from that uh, survey. On average, most of them worked over nine or close to or over nine hours per day. They worked six days per week, uh, roughly 50 weeks per year. And these workers that we surveyed, uh, their experience was roughly for a little over four years uh, of milking uh, experience. Uh, and you can see here the percentage of those uh, reporting that the most difficult milking task involved the strip procedure or the attach or detach of the milking unit procedure. Uh, surprisingly enough, well, at the time, it's not surprising to me now, <laughs> uh, that a very high percentage of these workers reported as having been kicked by a cow. And I can attest I'm now one of those, of having uh, been kicked by a cow. It's an unpleasant experience. But uh, you can uh, imagine just being in close proximity to the hind of the cow, um, you're, it's going to increase naturally your risk of being kicked or even stepped on by the cow. Here are some more uh, uh, data that, uh, from this particular study. And uh, this was a reported uh, discomfort uh, by the workers. Now, were we able to actually attribute this to what they did on the job? No, this is uh, basically just reported symptomology, locations, where they reported dis, uh, discomfort in the body. 
And I would address your attention down here uh, to the upper extremity, uh, which we combine shoulder, elbow, wrist, and hand. We did uh, divide this up more specifically into each of these, but for this table and for this presentation, we combine them for the upper extremity. The highest percentages uh, of reported discomfort were in the upper extremity, which uh, directed our future research to those uh, work tasks and those exposures uh, that primarily involve the upper extremity. This is a very upper extremity um, involved uh, work environment. And so that's where the majority of our research has been directed. So why did we shift our research from um, survey-based self-report to direct measurement? Well, uh, we're dealing with um, some self-report challenges. We're dealing with a non-English speaking uh, workforce, the culture, as well as uh, inherent, inherent biases associated with self-report uh, um, research data collection. Um, Observation-based research is often uh, associated with a number of uh, limitations. And then also the safety realities of just uh, getting in there, often taking video, uh, the safety of our research team, um, uh, taking video, which we often used or tried to uh, use for, for video-based observation. And so all of these um, pushed us or directed us to use direct measurement strategies to uh, further characterize uh, these exposures involved in the milking parlor. And so I'm going to flip this over to uh, Nate. He's going to take over from here and talk a little bit about the technologies and findings from our research. Thanks, David. So uh, over the next uh, few slides, I'll kick it back to David in a little while, but my, my goal here is just to present uh, a, a flavor for the kinds of measurement techniques that we have been using in the dairy parlors and, and some of the data that uh, we we're able to capture and use in order to characterize exposures and then direct evaluations of interventions. And so thinking about the upper extremity and the upper arm um, in terms of posture, repetition, velocity, and also rest and recovery, we've been focusing quite a bit on upper arm elevation. So essentially the, how high the upper arm is raised with respect to uh, gravity. And in early projects, um, going back, oh, what, David, to the mid-2000s, late 2000, uh, 2010 or so, we were using accelerometers, wearable accelerometers. They were quite a bit bigger uh, than the variety you see uh, in the picture on the right. Uh, initially, we used the virtual corset. Uh, this had some limitations in terms of sampling rate um, and, and synchronization between multiple devices worn at the same time. Uh, in recent years, we've moved to uh, more sophisticated inertial sensors, inertial measurement units. These are small, about the size, in fact, exactly the, the sensor platform that you see in the right. Uh, these are devices that contain uh, accelerometers and also gyroscopes and magnetometers. And theoretically, we can use these systems to capture three-dimensional uh, postures and movements in the workplace. Uh, however, that relies on having stable magnetometer uh, signals, which in industrial environments is not uh, typically feasible. So we have been uh, working with uh, combinations of accelerometer and gyroscope signals. And the reason that we do that, uh, an accelerometer is sensitive to all types of accelerations, not just uh, accelerations due to gravity that you would use to calculate an angle, uh, but also linear accelerations and um, things that you might experience under vibration. And, uh, and in fast motion, an accelerometer alone can lead to errors in, in terms of your estimate of the joint position. And so by incorporating a gyroscope, we're able to minimize those errors to a great extent. And so that uh, recently, uh, going back to about 2015, 2014, 15 or so, we've been using these um, accelerometer and gyroscope combinations. And, and the references that you see here describe some of our actual computational algorithms. And I think if you uh, go to the Chen paper, you can actually make your way to uh, uh, MATLAB libraries to show how we actually process all the signals. <clears throat> and click. Uh, I'm not going to talk about each one of these in detail. I just wanted to give you a sense of what we are able to compute from direct measurements. Um, 
you, we get time series data related to posture and movement velocities of, of body segments. And, and for the upper arm, you know, we're looking at uh, you know, the, the distribution of the, of the postures that we measure in terms of percentiles. But we can also do lots of uh, different types of analyses, separating into categories, examining the percent time with extremes of posture, uh, calculating percent time with high velocities and low velocities. Uh, the nice thing about this kind of approach um, is that if you have enough studies uh, using direct measures and processing in similar ways, you have a very large compendium of data from which you can compare uh, results between studies. So that's, um, that's one of the reasons um, that direct measures are attractive is because it allows for perhaps greater standardization of how we report exposures uh, in, different, in different settings. In terms of forces, uh, we are using uh, surface EMG, surface electromyography, and again, focusing on the upper extremity, we've been capturing data uh, from the uh, starting, um, proximally, starting with the upper trapezius, the anterior deltoid, biceps, the wrist flexors and extensors. Um, and because of the, uh, the nature of the work environment, uh, it's taken quite a bit of trial and error to, to get the the, the sensor attachment procedures um, to work properly, and, and all credit to David on that. He's been trying different, um, different uh, adhesives, different compression shirts, uh, all in an effort to make sure that when we do deploy these systems, attach them to workers, go through all of the calibration uh, that, that needs to happen to, to make sure that the data we capture are, are correct, or at least accurate to the extent that we can make it, uh, that we don't lose a sensor somewhere along the way and, and lose data. That, that's a, that's a, not a very good scenario from a research perspective. So we want to make sure all the sensors stay tight. So different adhesive compression shirts, you can see in the lower right here, uh, the EMG data logger is encased in, in the, uh, looks like just a plastic bag just to keep it dry and uh, so that we don't damage our equipment. And again, with, with EMG, we're getting time series data of muscle activation. Uh, and we normalize everything to maximum voluntary exertion. So percent MVE is what we call it. You might hear in other studies, uh, percent maximum voluntary contraction or percent MVC. Uh, but again, we can compute uh, percentiles, which is very common. Uh, we've also been examining different parameters of rest and recovery, looking at percent time with muscle rest and, and gap analysis, if you're familiar with that kind of approach. Uh, so lots of different ways in which we're examining data. And again, we don't have time to go through each of these in detail. So what I thought I would do is just show you a few examples, uh, starting with upper arm uh, posture and velocities. And uh, these plots are comparing herringbone parallel and rotary in terms of different parameters from these direct measures. So on the left, we're seeing the percent time with upper elevation uh, exceeding 60 degrees. In the middle is the percent time with upper arm movement velocity uh, exceeding 90 degrees per second, which, is, which would basically be raising your arm uh, from hanging relaxed at the side to shoulder height uh, in about one second's time. And then on the right is the percent time with both neutral posture and low velocity using those definitions from the previous slides. And a couple things uh, pop out to me when I look at these, uh, at these plots. And, and on the right, you see some initial thoughts. If you look at rotary parlors, so rotary is on the right side of each plot, we see less percent time with extreme upper arm elevation in rotaries compared to the herringbone and parallel. We see less time with uh, high upper arm velocities in rotary compared to herringbone and parallel. And we see more time uh, with neutral posture and, and low velocity in rotary parlors. Uh, the other thing that I find interesting um, is the uh, time with upper arm velocity. Again, we have left arm versus right arm, and you can see in parallel has the greatest percent time with upper arm velocity, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to that uh, in the subsequent slides. Here I'm showing the effect of parlor configuration on full shift measures of muscle activity. So that's something I, I failed to mention earlier is that uh, well, much of our data collection is, is full shift in nature, meaning we, we show up at the dairy, um, we have uh, workers that uh, we are going to measure, we go through the informed consent process, we attach, calibrate, put the sensors on, 
and then we're measuring all day. And so what I'm showing here is a group mean muscle activity levels where the groups are those in the herringbone, parallel, and rotary parlors. And just to orient you to these slides, uh, thinking about our, our muscle activity summary metrics, the static levels down here. So this would be the 10th percentile muscle activity. This would be the 50th percentile or the median level, and then the peak muscle activities are the 90th percentile. Uh, and so a couple of uh, results from here, when we look at the wrist extensors, the biceps and the anterior deltoid, we see higher muscle activities in the parallel parlor compared to the other uh, parlor types. We also see a little bit higher muscle activity in the parallel uh, for the wrist extensors compared to the herringbone. And that is uh, not totally different, although herringbone uh, had the highest muscle activity for the wrist flexors um, and it was greater than the, than the rotary in this case. But um, in no case, it, for the upper trapezius, there was no statistically significant difference between the, the peak muscle activities between the parlor configurations. Um, and in no case was the, the rotary muscle activity uh, greater than the others. And then on this slide, uh, what we're looking at is the effective parlor configuration on task level. So the previous slides were all full shift uh, muscle activities and, and upper arm postures and movements, which reflect really job level exposures. Uh, but we spent quite a bit of time getting down into the task level. So this dip, strip, wipe, and, and examining postures and movements and muscle activities across these different tasks to try and get a sense of where intervention efforts might be best directed uh, at the task level. Um, so something, a couple very interesting things to, to take away from this particular slide. There is a clear, this is from the dip task in parallel, herringbone, and rotary. So each burst here, if we just sort of look at the rotary first, each burst, so from about two seconds to seven seconds, that's one cow. So we have one, two, we have 10 cows in a row, and that's the case for each of these traces. So in herringbone, it's 10 cows here. And in parallel, it's 10 cows here. So this is an example of how the parlor configuration affects the temporal pattern of muscle activity. And there's this little metric here called BCT, which in our nomenclature, that stands for between cow time. So that's like the, the little rest break between, between cows. So the rotary parlor introduced uh, a much higher levels of, of rest and recovery between cows. So it's two and a half seconds between cows compared to 0.4 seconds in the parallel parlor. And, and that's because in herringbone and parallel in particular, uh, the workers just sort of uh, do the dip task and 10 cows in a row or the, however many cows there are assigned, they do them all in a row and then they come back and do the strip and then they come back and do the wipe. Whereas in a rotary, uh, it's machine paced. And so the worker is there uh, and the, the task that they're doing is the dip task and they have to wait for the next cow to come. They wait for the next cow to come. So there's not this rush and not this, this sense of time pressure to go as fast as possible uh, by nature of the machine pacing, which is kind of an interesting result. And, and this finding is consistent with what we saw uh, with the full shift posture movement velocity measures. Remember I mentioned that in, in parallel parlors in particular, the, the time with high upper arm velocities was much greater than in in the other designs and particularly the rotary. This slide is showing um, the comparisons across the milking tasks. So the purple squares, the dip, and then we have strip, wipe, and attach. Uh, and what this is, this is only for parallel parlors. We had 32 measurements, 32 workers measured in parallel parlors. And these are the group means again, uh, looking at the static, median, peak muscle activity levels by milking task. And what's interesting here is that the dip, strip, and wipe uh, had greater activity levels than, than the attach. And I find that interesting because when, when we were looking through prior research, uh, it appeared that most uh, efforts had focused on the, on the attachment task rather than these other pre-milking tasks. Uh, and so we spent quite a bit of, of effort over the last few years examining these particular tasks and thinking about interventions for these particular pre-milking tasks, uh, which was a, a bit of a, a need in comparison to the larger amount of research that's available for the, for the attachment task.
Okay, <clears throat> I'm going to take over for the next few slides and talk a little bit about the task specific control strategies uh, that we evaluated. One of those is uh, a what they call in the industry a semi automatic or automated teeth scrubber. And we evaluated the uh, future cow alpha technology uh, made by alpha technologies. And basically what this is, is a handheld device that has uh, rotating uh, brushes at the end of this and the worker holds uh, the end of this up to the end of each teeth and it uh, performs the dip, strip, and wipe task all in one. And so a chemical is applied in this, um, the rotating action of the, of the brushes inside um, serves as a stimulation for the cow and um, fac facilitates milk letdown. And then also uh, just um, after the cleaning and the application of the chemical, uh, the teat is clean and there's really no uh, need for wiping off of any, any chemical. It, it dries on itself. And so we performed this uh, evaluation inside an actual um, parlor. And you can see here the teat scrubber here on the left, how it's held up to the udder. And then we did not want to disrupt milking operations. We um, uh, constructed a wooden udder. And so the workers, after performing the the regular dip strip wipe uh, manual tasks, we would have them come down and apply the uh, teach cover to our artificial udder here. And here's one uh, strip showing the different um, uh, muscle activities uh, for the different muscles of interest, the upper trap on the top, uh, followed by the anterior deltoid, the biceps, the fl uh, forearm flexors and the forearm extensors. And you can see here uh, the dip, the strip, and then the wipe, and then here in the middle is the 10 cows of the milking unit attachment. And then over here is the uh, performing uh, the simulated teat scrubber application. And so what's of interest here is how that the teat scrubber could potentially replace three milking tasks with one task. Now you might see some of these, or you do see some of these a higher amplitude in that, but this is offset by um, three tasks uh, being replaced with one task. And so this was one um, uh, control measure that we evaluated. And as a result of this, the maker of the teeth scrubber, uh, we, we uh, presented our findings and we realized that it did increase uh, some muscle activity in, in some isolated muscles. And as a result, the manufacturer has changed the design of the milk cluster, moving the drive shaft back to where it's more in line with where uh, the milking uh, tool is, is held by the hand. We also evaluated different milking unit designs. And you can see here on the right that uh, there are different components of a milking unit. And so, and different types of materials that are used to manufacture these milking units. And so we evaluated a number of different milking units that were uh, made uh, differently and used different materials from uh, hard plastics to uh, stainless steel. And so based on those findings, uh, we determined that there are uh, differences uh, between milking units, the materials that were uh, used in those, the spread of the milking unit. And what I mean by the spread is the uh, distance between where each um, um, teat cup comes out of the claw here. And so that influences how wide the hand has to be to handle each of these uh, uh, teat cups. And then we also uh, found differences in the teat cup straight, uh, shape, uh, the dimensions of those. And so we found potential in uh, different milking unit designs and their ability to reduce muscle fatigue or even discomfort, potentially improving worker performance, as well as potentially preventing the development of adverse musculoskeletal symptoms. And then now Nate is gonna take over and uh, present our last uh, topic of how we are now uh, assessing worker performance. Thanks, David. So one of the key objectives of milking parlor work is to make sure that the teats are cleaned and sanitized and ready for the milking cluster to be attached before milk is harvested. 
And so we, we've already learned about the dip strip and white tasks, and we've seen photos of, photos of those. Um, one common method of assessing the effectiveness of, of that pre-milking routine, the dip strip and wipe, might be for a producer, a supervisor, uh, an extension representative to come back after the wipe, but before the milking unit is attached and obtain a, a second wipe uh, using a, a clean sheet of, of gauze. And that's what's shown here on the, on the left. So again, this is a, a wipe, a uh, sample wipe obtained after the pre-milking tasks, after dip, strip, and wipe, but before the milking cluster is attached. And then uh, there's observation-based scoring scales, such as the one shown here uh, that was produced by uh, Westphalia Surge, uh, where it's just an ordinal scale. So the observer would look at the amount of, of dirt, manure, bedding, uh, some of the sanitizing chemical would examine the material left on this on this gauze and then make an assessment, a scoring assessment of one, two, three, or four as to whether or not the, the teat was clean or there was a large, larger amount of dirt manure present. So that's the usual method. And um, that's, you know, it, it's, it's not to take anything away from the method, um, but from, a, from the perspective of trying to really objectively measure worker performance. That's a relatively crude scoring method. It also comes with some problems. Um, we, we could not identify uh, really any robust uh, validations of these methods in terms of their ability to, uh, of different people to rate the same way or the same person to rate similarly over repeated assessments. And so we ran a little, a little study uh, recently published where we examine the inter-rater and intra-rater reliability of this scoring scale and not surprisingly it, it, the results were not promising uh, in order it, essentially poor inter-rater reliability only moderate intra-rater reliability um, if you've got <clears throat> we had eight raters um, and the rating scores of the same sample the same gauze the same wipe uh, differed by more than two from more than 25% of 200 images that we presented to them of these of these samples, meaning that in more than 25% of the cases, the range of scores uh, exceeded two. So you have people that, you know, scores ranging from two to four, one to three, so forth. And our raters provided a unanimous rating only for 13% of the images that we presented. Again, 200 images, eight raters. Um, so we sought out to to create a more objective method and settled on this idea of image processing uh, where perhaps we could, we could quantify through, through clever uh, image processing techniques, standard image processing techniques, we could quantify the amount of dirt and other material dip residue that's, that's left on these wipes prior to milking attachment as an objective measure of performance. And so uh, David, probably in his garage, crafted this little clamshell where we would, we would take a wipe um, at the farm and put it in this clamshell and then put it in a photo box and take an image so we could standardize the image dimensions, standardize the lighting conditions. And then what's on the right would be uh, uh, one of the images that we would obtain. And then essentially we process that, process that image using a, a supervised uh, machine learning algorithm. It's not terribly fancy, and conceptually, it's fairly simple. So if you imagine on the left is our original image, uh, we're going to take areas within this region, this circular region of interest that are three by three pixels uh, in, in size, and we're going to quantify the color information in each three by three pixel area, and that HSL, that's the hue, saturation, luminance. So we're going to quantify the colors in each three by three pixel area according to this HSL color space, and then we're going to compare that color information to a database of labeled samples. This is, this is a common machine learning technique. Um, so we compare it to the database, and then our algorithm picks out uh, the number of samples that are closest in color information to the color information in the 3 by 3 pixel area. And then using a k-nearest neighbor, neighbor model assigns one of these four categories, dip green, dip yellow, dirt, or white, uh, to that three by three pixel area, and then repeats that process across the full region of interest uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the white. 
And so what we can do then is use this image processing technique to classify or categorize or quantify the amount of uh, dirt, manure, bedding, uh, the different uh, dip solutions, uh, the particular farm that, that these data were obtained from used a, a, a yellow colored iodine based uh, solution during pre-milking and then a green uh, post-milking solution. So we were able to see uh, both of those using our, our image classifier and then quantify the amount of uh, these materials. On the right, uh, we've just uh, been looking at some, some new data where we collected these wipe samples and ran image processing over the course of eight hours. So we would, uh, at the end of, of each hour of, of work, we would collect the number of samples from each worker and then quantify the amount of dirt bedding residue, the other materials left. And we see this interesting uh, shape that's kind of like an inverted U or, or what David likes to call the bathtub where we have a little bit higher uh, a percentage of undesirable material. This is the yellow a dip solution up here, this is the dirt. But then after time, you can see that it, it drops a little bit, but then comes back, comes back up. So that could be indicative of, of fatigue. And that's one of our ongoing analyses to relate these changes in performance. Um, with respect to, to muscle fatigue. So in summary, uh, we just kind of want to wrap it up here a little bit and talk about some of the challenges and impact. <clears throat> we get asked a lot of times, you know, how are we getting on these farms? Um, it's a challenging, it is a challenge and it, it is basically a result of about, you know, 15, 18 years of uh, working with the industry, working with uh, individual producers as well as associations, um, cooperatives, and establishing trust, uh, not only with the owners of these farms, but within the industry, and more importantly, the workers. And so we have experienced um, uh, receptive ears in the industry uh, to the point where we have uh, established a great trust with uh, uh, producers in several states that is, has enabled us to uh, collect this data and conduct, you know, ongoing research. And uh, a lot of it is uh, just asking them, what are your needs? What, um, what are the challenges that you are facing? How can we help you? How can we uh, address uh, not just the worker health and safety issues on your farm, but also uh, business-minded uh, productivity and efficiency? And um, that has uh, resulted in uh, uh, multiple opportunities to conduct this type of research. As you might expect, many challenges uh, conducting this type of research on the farm. Um, not only in the variations of uh, parlor configurations, but how they milk the cows, their routines, and the equipment used. And then technical obstacles. Uh, methodological uh, efficiency is an issue. Uh, when do we show up on the farm? Well, many of these work shifts start at 5 a.m., meaning we have to show up at 4, even 3.30. We have a uh, camper <laughs> that has been provided to us uh, from New Mexico State University, and, and they have uh, allowed us to use that for research purposes, and so, um, which is really nice. And so uh, just being able to show up, uh, set up the worker, put sensors on them, monitor them throughout a full eight, 10, even a 12 hour work shift, take the equipment off, um, can be challenging. And then we show up oftentimes the night shift or even the next day. Impact. Um, so our goal is to not only uh, positively impact uh, the, the health and safety of the worker, but also to optimize the system, especially in light of the immigration challenges that are going on. Uh, without getting into discussion of the whole immigration um, uh, system and how that might be affecting the ag community, um, dairy producers right now are challenged with uh, recruiting um, qualified workers and then also retaining them um, to work on the farm. And so that is one of uh, our objectives. Um, we are not only addressing the worker health issue, but we are also working on worker performance. Um, traditionally in the industry, a lot of the research and attention has been, has been placed on the cow and the cow health and cow performance. 
Well, the industry now is shifting uh, uh, or placing an increased attention on the worker, which is good. And then also producer policy organizations are taking note. We um, uh, are working with a number of organizations, not only uh, local and state producer associations, but also policy organizations uh, to, uh, and we have a seat at the table to where um, we can posit positively affect any um, policy changes uh, as they relate to worker health and safety. So in closing, I'd like to acknowledge our uh, funding sources, primarily from the CDC and NIOSH uh, here at my institution, uh, the UT uh, School of Public Health, the Southwest Center for Occupational Environmental Health. Uh, a lot of my dairy research has uh, been funded through High Cause, the Ag Center in Colorado, and then Dr. Fetke, the Heartland Center in Iowa, and the Great Plains Ag Center. And then I'd like to close with this one quote from uh, our past president, George Bush, um, a nation that is unable to grow enough food to feed its people is a, is a nation at risk. And so our ag uh, industry depends on a healthy workforce to produce uh, the food that we enjoy at cheap prices uh, across the country. And so it is a matter of national security that uh, we address worker health and safety issues in the ag industry. So with that, I'll put up our contact information if anyone would like to uh, contact us directly, and then I guess we'll open it up for questions if there are any. Okay, thank you so much, David and Nate, for this presentation. Um, at this time, if you do want to navigate to the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A box. You can ask any questions that you need, and I will present them to um, David and Nate. I do have one question. It says, under the One Health model, how do the conventional teat preparation tasks compare to the teat scrubber in terms of stress, discomfort, or pain to the animal? That's a good question. So we did not address, um, or have we have not even addressed the, the pain uh, or any discomfort to the worker, um, I mean, sorry, to the cow. And so we did not assess that. There are many farms across the country that are using the teat scrubber right now. And so um, when introducing this new type of method into, inside of a parlor, you know, it takes a little while for the cows to become used to it, but it is not, um, you know, based on our observations, anecdotal observations, it's no big deal with the cow. Um, they, it's just part of the milking process and, and uh, no issues with the cow. Okay, thank you for that. Um, at this time, we don't have any more questions, um, but I did want to thank the presenters and everybody who joined us today for today's webinar. Our next NIOSH ERC webinar will be assessing heat stress associated changes um, in postural balance among firefighters. That's going to be Wednesday, July 17th. Um, I do have one more question that just popped up. Um, are there any opportunities to look at differences in injury rates based on the three different configurations of cows? Are first aid injuries recordable? Are first, the, well, you said there at the end, did you say first aid injuries or? Yeah, that's what the question, first aid injuries. Okay, it's very difficult. Well, it's very difficult to obtain actual injury illness um, information and we have been rather reluctant to um, even ask that type of information of the producer for them and I'm assuming that they're referring to providing OSHA um, recordables and so we have not asked that as part of any of our research projects um, not to say that it can't be done um, you know the new uh, uh, OSHA reporting electronic reporting may present an opportunity to um, uh, study that recordables um, across institutions. Um, the problem with that is it's probably not going to provide much fidelity of getting down to uh, if the injury took place inside of the milky parlor. Uh, there are many other opportunities for injury across the dairy farm. And so um, I don't know if that, uh, that mechanism will provide that level of, um, of data. Um, so uh, there have been some research um, 
out there looking at workers' comp uh, claims. Uh, one of my early studies looked at uh, claim analysis, livestock handling injuries on dairy farms, and one of the studies did show that the majority of those uh, claims took place inside the milking parlor. Um, other than that, uh, th I think that that is an opportunity or a research idea that needs to be pursued to actually uh, find out uh, actual um, injuries uh, that, that, uh, to compare those across uh, parlor configurations. Okay, thank you so much for that. Um, I have one more question. Do you, do you see opportunity to use SEMG data to predict potential injuries or injury symptoms? Nate, I'll let you take that one. Yeah, that's an excellent question. And I think if I had an answer for that, uh, I would likely be off making a lot of money somewhere else rather than in an academic role, to be frank. Uh, <laughs> the, the ability to predict injury from exposure information is a, is a difficult nut to crack. There, there's um, frankly just not enough um, high quality epidemiologic studies available that have used direct measures um, in a way that allows us to, to develop these dose response relationships that, that, would, that would help us answer that question. Um, I think as these, as these measurement systems become uh, smaller in form factor, more acceptable to the worker, more acceptable to management. Um, it, you know, they're already becoming a little bit more ubiquitous in everyday life. I mean, think about all the wearable technology that people have on them uh, on a day on a daily basis. I think it's inevitable that, uh, that that we'll be able to to leverage these huge data sets to to make some of these answers. Uh, that are currently unknown, uh, uh, knowable. So I think it's it's quite a bit of ways off. Uh, I certainly see it on the horizon, but at this time, uh, it's difficult to say with certainty that some specific parameter from uh, surface EMG or even from uh, posture and movement data from IMUs uh, is going to be predictive of, of injury. I think there are some maybe some ways that we could attack that problem. Uh, big data is one, but I think also, um, you know, personal interest of mine is is trying to to uh, capture uh, repeated measurements. So measuring the same people on multiple days and looking for uh, trying to quantify their their movement patterns and and maybe muscle activity patterns rather than the amplitude. What is like the day to day or even the cycle to cycle uh, pattern of muscle activity? And perhaps there may be some nuggets in there that we could identify changes in patterns over time that could relate to injury. But again, those are hypotheses that, that I think are, are yet to be explored. Good question. Okay, and I have um, one last question that we'll try to get to. Um, how many employees per shift as an average work in a farm or parlor? Good question. Um, so, on a farm, you have so many different areas. You've got uh, maternity, you've got the, the uh, commodity growing, meaning uh, are they, you know, what's going on out on the uh, crops. Um, you've got the feeding of the cows. Um, on average, what I am seeing now for your typical 2,000 to 2,500 uh, herd operation, you can see anywhere from 25 to about 30 workers uh, on a farm. Um, inside the parlor, uh, assuming three shifts, uh, three milking shifts, now they're going, because of the, the industry milk prices and cutting costs, um, they've gone from three shifts to two milking shifts, two 12-hour shifts. And so that is where the most of your workers are gonna work. They're gonna work inside the parlor. So depending on the the parlor configuration in its capacity, i.e. number of milking stalls inside there, that's gonna dictate your milking routine. And so you're gonna see anywhere from three to four, and even in the larger milking parlors, maybe up to five or even six uh, workers with one worker call, who's called a pusher, uh, who often uh, performs some milking tasks, but they're the ones who go out and brings the pen of cows to the to the parlor for milking. And so I've seen uh, anywhere from three to five, maybe even six workers inside the parlor 
So. Great, thank you so much. And again, thank you for presenting. Um, we were all glad to have you and I'm sure everybody learned a lot today. I did wanna take a moment to mention that we have um, an in-person ergonomics workshop coming up in, in Berkeley, Richmond area from July 10th through the 12th. Information about that will be sent to you in your, um, your post email after the webinar. And the Southwest Center of Occupational um, and Environmental Health is going to be sending out certificates of completion to everybody who was here today. So look out for that in your email sometime next week. And thank you again to David and Nate um, for your time and expertise on this topic. And we will see you guys in one month for the Assessing Heat Stress Associated Changes and Postural Balance Among Firefighters webinar presented by the University of Cincinnati ERC. Thank you, everybody, and we will see you guys next time. Thank you.